Hey everyone, thanks for coming back. In this video, I'll go over Artemis II Orion news, including the OIG report that's related to that. And there was a big milestone for Mobile Launcher 2 this week. NASA's Orion program and prime contractor Lockheed Martin are getting the spacecraft for Artemis II ready for vacuum testing at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida as a part of overall assembly and test. While outside, we're still digesting the report released by the NASA Inspector General's office on May 1st. There were a few unusual things in the report, including a little back and forth, which raise a few big picture questions. There was also what was absent from the report and some useful footnotes worth pointing out. A few miles north of where Orion production is, the structure of the launch platform for Mobile Launcher 2 was moved onto the pedestals at the Launch Complex 39 East Park site. That milestone, which was completed on May 9th, enables assembly of the umbilical tower structure to begin. There was also an industry conference in Washington, D.C. this past week that provided a forecast about the Artemis III schedule and another SLS study. So let's go past the sound bites and into the weeds on that. The investigation into the root cause of unexpected Orion base heat shield behavior during the Artemis I re-entry is still in the news. As I noted in the video recapping NASA's Artemis II briefing to the NASA Advisory Council Human Exploration and Operations Committee, Catherine Kerner disclosed the plan for an independent review team in their response to the recent NASA Inspector General report. She is the head of the agency's Human Exploration Mission Directorate. As she wrote in the response published in the report, quote, an independent review team effort planned for May 2024 will confirm the team's recommendations to the program on the root cause, heat shield capability, and corrective actions going forward, unquote. NASA also provided a statement in response to reporting in a story by Stephen Clark with Ars Technica. The statement says in part, quote, in late April, NASA chartered an independent review team, which includes experts outside the agency, to conduct an independent evaluation of the investigation results. That review, scheduled to be complete this summer, ensures NASA properly understands this condition and has corrective actions in place for Artemis II and future missions." Unquote. NASA Public Affairs made that statement available at the same time as they confirmed that the independent review team mentioned in this statement and the one that Ms. Kerner wrote about in her April 19th response to the NASA Office of the Inspector General, or OIG, are the same. While that root cause investigation continues, the Artemis II Orion short stack, the crew and service modules, and the spacecraft adapter cone is back in the final assembly systems test cell in the ONC building. Lockheed Martin Orion production and final assembly take place in the industrial operations zone of the Neil Armstrong operations and checkout building. And it's a lot quicker to say that's done in the IOZ of the ONC building. The spacecraft was moved back to the fast cell from the altitude chamber after electromagnetic interference and compatibility testing in April and NASA published a few more pictures of that April 27th return to the fast cell this last week. The EMI-EMC tests that were performed in the altitude chamber were done at one atmosphere, not at vacuum or minimum pressure. Those tests, the vacuum tests, are currently scheduled for July. The OIG report, number IG-24-011, published on May 1st, made news in a number of ways. It disclosed several previously unreported details, in particular about the performance of the Orion heat shield during the Artemis I re-entry on December 11, 2022. The report included pictures previously unseen in public and anomalies not previously disclosed. The NASA Human Exploration Directorate, represented by Exploration Systems Development Associate Administrator Catherine Kerner, concurred with all the aerospace engineering recommendations in the report, but they pushed back on the messenger, and the back and forth in the report raised eyebrows. That's already been covered in some detail in news reporting on the day of publication, but there are a few takeaways worth repeating or emphasizing. First, 
OIG is essential to giving the public the opportunity to make informed choices about the programs they are paying for. Several pieces of information were revealed to the public in this report for the first time, even though Artemis I was completed basically a year and a half ago. The issue with some Avcoat material liberating from the heat shield during the Artemis I reentry was known, but the information provided was qualitative and no imagery was published of the heat shield appearance. It's hard to score the descriptions previously provided about how much Avcoat was lost with the pictures that the OIG published. Some imaginations would run wild anyway, but there wasn't enough detail or context provided by NASA in the last year to slow down anyone's imagination. In the case of the issue with the separation bolt in the retention and release mechanism between the Orion crew module and service module, that had not been previously disclosed. There are a few retention and release mechanisms on Orion, Another example are the ones that attach the launch abort system tower to the top of the crew module. These ones physically attach the crew module to the service module. As you can see in these pictures taken when the Artemis One crew and service modules were mated in July 2019, there are four attach points on this heat shield design, which was being flown and tested for the first time on Artemis One. In these pictures, you can't see the separation bolt within the overall assembly. We're mostly seeing the service module bracket that attaches to the crew module adapter, but there are graphics showing the different elements of the retention and release mechanism. The OIG report was the first public disclosure of the issue. As with the images documenting the state of the base heat shield, the OIG report also includes an image showing the post-flight condition of one of the bolts. The report notes that after the explosive bolts are fired to separate the crew module and service module prior to entry interface, the part of the bolt on the crew module side is supposed to be flush with the compression pad that sits around the bolt assembly. That was not the case with three of the four bolts, and those areas saw more melting and erosion. In other cases, the OAG report provided additional details to issues that had already been disclosed, and these are obvious reasons why audits like these are essential, because the Inspector General is pretty much the only organization informing the public that is allowed this level of access. For what it's worth, another takeaway is that OIG did not recommend drastic changes to Artemis II, like taking the crew off the mission. OIG made recommendations that they say will ensure the safety of the crewed lunar flyby mission. The issues with the base heat shield could also have implications beyond Artemis II. Even if NASA can find flight rationale for this test flight, it may only be good one time. Changes could be coming to the heat shield for Artemis III or Artemis IV or beyond, and incorporating heat shield changes could make it an even greater challenge to fly Artemis III or any Artemis mission one year after Artemis II. It's another reminder that the Artemis Manifest after Artemis II is still very much subject to change, which is another one of those reasons why I'm in the group that is keen to keep up with activities and planning on a more frequent basis. Speaking of a more frequent basis, there are a number of big picture questions that this OIG report raises. I already wondered why NASA didn't make the pictures and details in the OIG report public before the report was released, but there are other questions too. One of those is why this OIG audit about NASA readiness for Artemis II didn't say anything about SLS. Both the Exploration Ground Systems and Orion post-flight analysis was detailed in this report, but the Space Launch System is mentioned by name only a couple of times and there's nothing noted about the performance of the launch vehicle. Obviously, these are rhetorical questions since answers are unlikely to be forthcoming. Another question is why OIG only performs these audits on a one-time basis. The other NASA technical oversight bodies, like the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, are standing boards that meet with NASA on a regular basis. As the OIG noted in their response to NASA, quote, we will continue to provide the level of oversight of the Artemis campaign that we deem appropriate, unquote. They can do whatever they want, but random audits are more likely to disconnect them from the issues and also mean that the public will only be informed to this degree 
on an irregular basis. The major milestone for Mobile Launcher 2 was that construction on the launch platform structure, its base, progressed to the point where it could be moved onto the permanent pedestals at the East Park site. The base was under construction at the East Park site, but it was initially assembled on temporary mounts closer to ground level. This jack and set operation transferred the base structure from the temp mounts to Crawler Transporter 2, which then moved it to the permanent pedestals. The base structure was lifted off the temp mounts first on May 6th by self-propelled modular transporters, or SPMTs. Then it was jacked up to a height that allowed CT2 to roll in underneath and pick it up. Crawler Transporter 2 had been going through a major maintenance period in High Bay 1 of the Vehicle Assembly Building that began in January. This NASA Public Affairs social media post outlined some of the work done which enabled the crawler to support this Mobile Launcher 2 construction operation and was also performed during a period where Mobile Launcher 1 did not need transportation. That period could be concluding soon. Whenever the verification and validation work at Pad 39B is completed, Mobile Launcher 1 will need to be rolled off the pad and back to the SLS integration cell, which is VAB High Bay 3. On May 7th, a test drive of the crawler was completed to help verify all the modifications, and then the next day on May 8th, the Mobile Launcher 2 base was lifted up most of the way to the height needed for the crawler to roll in underneath. The remainder of the operations were completed on May 9th. The last part of the lift by the jacks was completed in the morning, then CT2 rolled in and picked up the base using a different set of lift points. It then rolled the structure over the pedestals and lowered the base down onto them before rolling away. Pre-assembled sections of the Mobile Launcher 2 umbilical tower can now be assembled on the launch platform, and in the meantime, internal outfitting will continue. There were a couple of Artemis notes from the 2024 Humans to Mars Summit in Washington, D.C. Presentations to the industry conference were made on May 7th and 8th. The first note came after a presentation by Mike Serafin, who is one of the Artemis mission managers. Mr. Serafin was the Artemis 1 mission manager and is serving the same role for Artemis 3. Matt Ramsey is the mission manager for Artemis 2 and Artemis 4. In the question and answer period after Mr. Serafin's presentation, he was asked about when the Starship HLS lunar landing uncrewed demonstration would occur before Artemis 3. He said that he believed it was either the fall of 2025 or the spring of 2026. These are all like weather forecasts at the moment, and the forecast will change as development and preparations progress towards that milestone, but it at least provides a little insight into how that demonstration might fall on a milestone schedule for a September 2026 launch of Artemis 3. The other item of interest from the conference related to Artemis was a presentation of another SLS conceptual study by Boeing. Dr. James Green, who was NASA's chief scientist when he retired from the space agency at the beginning of 2022, after more than 40 years there, made the presentation about a Mars sample return concept. NASA suspended development of its existing Mars sample return plans due to budget problems and asked industry to make alternative proposals. As a part of the options, NASA did say that SLS could be used in proposals as Government Furnished Equipment, or GFE. Dr. Green worked on this conceptual study with a group that included Boeing SLS engineers who have published many conceptual studies since the inception of SLS, promoting other uses for it besides launching Orion to the moon. The Boeing concept in the presentation utilizes a cargo version of SLS, apparently Block 1B cargo, for a single launch Mars sample return architecture. There are similarities at a high level to the concept that Dr. Mike Griffin made in a congressional hearing back in January. The difference between that study and many previous Boeing promotional concepts is that this study concept is apparently a formal proposal that will be submitted very soon. Rapid mission design study proposals for a Mars sample return mission are due on May 17th, so we'll see how competitive this Boeing proposal is with the other proposals from industry. With respect to Artemis, this latest SLS conceptual study again highlights current uncertainties with NASA's plans to commercialize the SLS program 
and its plans for utilization of the launch vehicle for Artemis and non-Artemis missions. The biggest issues for SLS remain cost and availability. Congress went down this road for about four years when it was made a legal requirement that SLS launch the Europa Clipper spacecraft to Jupiter. In that case, both cost and availability were issues through that period from 2016 through 2020. In this industry request, NASA says they will determine what their costs are for an SLS cargo vehicle. It's not likely those will be made public, but it would be interesting to see those numbers and how those were determined. Back at the time, there was a potential conflict in the availability of the third SLS vehicle between Artemis and Europa Clipper, which Artemis won. NASA held an option for a fourth Block 1 upper stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, that it would have used if the mandate had remained law. Instead, technical compatibility issues with SLS to launch Europa Clipper were kind of a last straw. The SLS mandate was formally removed in 2021, and Europa Clipper will launch on a Falcon Heavy later this year. This Mars sample return mission wouldn't launch until the next decade, but the question is whether that is far enough in the future to avoid availability conflicts. Having said all that, perhaps this is an indication that Boeing and Northrop Grumman are still planning for the Deep Space Transport Partnership, something we haven't heard about at all for almost a year, except from OIG. It's also one of the few indications in a long time that SLS cargo is still something being considered by NASA for non-Artemis uses in the distant future. This mission would be nearly 10 years away. SLS availability will be a watch item for at least the rest of this decade for Artemis, so we'll see if the production tempo has increased enough to support both Artemis Orion launches and non-Artemis, non-Orion cargo launches in the 2030s. There was also a footnote in the OIG report worth pointing out, related to limited operating life items, or LOLIs. The report talked about the timing of stacking the SLS solid rocket boosters for Artemis II, given that they have a baseline 12-month stack life, which was extended multiple times for Artemis I. The report notes that the first booster elements were stacked on the mobile launcher for Artemis I in November of 2020, but that is not when the clock starts for stack life. It starts with the first segment-to-segment -segment mate, and due to the situation with Artemis I in November 2020, NASA did not begin those stacking operations until January 2021. NASA has been asked about when they plan to start stacking for Artemis II going back to last year, if I recall correctly, and when I asked Exploration Ground Systems about this in January, it was stated that was not the intention this time. If they don't plan to hold between the first elements and the first segment-to-segment -segment mates, then the stacking clock for Artemis II is likely to start closer to the overall beginning of SRB assembly on the mobile launcher. The footnote that was useful was at the bottom, showing the ranking of the top three limited life items. Battery life, number of rollouts from the VAB to the pad, and booster stack life. Battery life is vague, but it may be referring to the flight termination system batteries or the flight batteries for different vehicle elements, or both groups since they are installed late in the process to preserve operating life.